because you're so nice and you came early. Uh, did anybody have an answer to this question? Yes? Uh -huh. I'm curious. I have a question about the question. Okay. Uh, the random number, is it chosen like every time you call the heuristic function? Or when you no, just once. I'll just give you its class. That's a very good question. Uh, so I'm basically taking H and then um, giving you, you know, H of n for different values of n already has. So for every place, I'm just adding a small random number, making sure that it never crosses H star. So which actually means, for example, at the goal node, I should make sure that I'm only adding zero. Right? You do see that. Because if I add anything other than zero, then it becomes invisible at the goal node. This is one of these other killer questions where you know I basically nobody really does this, it's just a thinking exercise. Yes, you had an answer then? Yeah, so I think that adding a random number will probably hurt you uh, a lot like the basic we saw yesterday, where you sort of want your heuristic function to match the shape of the actual so you you're just you're saying it may hurt you a little bit, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else? Yes. If you're guaranteeing invisibility, then wouldn't a star and i a star both be optimal anyway? So you could use both. Yeah. Again, okay. that it's your question. It's your answer. So you're saying that they're optimal and you use it, yeah. presumably. Okay. Yes. Name. Uh, okay. Okay. So. If you're guaranteeing, adding to his point, if you're guaranteeing that it's admissible and uh, you have your function, you're just adding a constant to it. You basically take it a little above and closer, retaining the shape of the heuristic and you take it closer to your x star. So I guess it will be better. Why would the adding a random number keep the shape? It's not very clear. Um, anybody else? Yes. Name. But uh -huh. it should not matter if you're just adding a small constant. By the way, it's not the same random number everywhere. Okay, you do realize that for each node n, I'm adding a different random number. After all, right? Because for the node that corresponds to G, I have to add only a zero. But every node I'm adding a different random number between zero and one. Anybody else? Yes. Uh -huh. So yeah, of course, obviously. So by the way, how many people think H, H dash is more informed than H? How many people think it's more informed than H? Okay. How many people think it's not informed? It's less informed. Okay. It's by definition it is more informed than H. Because in every place it's greater or equal to H. It's guaranteed to be more informed. Otherwise, this is not an interesting question. I am giving you probably more informed heuristic. And so, you know, my son used to have this um, you know, heuristic when I used to, you know, if you're a teacher, then you're always, you know, torturing people around you. So I would ask him questions. And his heuristic is obviously the answer cannot be the obvious one. <laughs> because you would have asked me. Okay, so here's the deal. So I'm giving you a more informed heuristic. And I'm saying, would you use it? Right? And I'm asking, you, would you use it? That's my question. So you could use my son's heuristic, maybe, and then figure out. But you have to give a reason. Yes, no, okay, you already talked. So somebody else. Yes, name. Uh -huh. So uh, in the previous study, you used an example in which one of the analytics was exactly straight line, and the other one was. That's the one everybody has been talking about. This is the problem of uh, what is called the. Uh, the I mean, you know, you have to remember that the exam can't be just the last thing you learn. It's about everything that you're learning now. Okay, so I know that all of you are stuck with that beautiful car. Let me tell you the answer has nothing to do with that. Maybe that's a hint. It has something to do with something else that we spoke about. By the way, this was one of the many, many exam questions on a single exam one time. 
for them. So this is the kind of sadism that is prevalent in this class. <laughs> Somebody from the back rows. Somebody who thinks they have an answer anyway. Yes? My name is Alina. So while using address, uh, we are doing ID HR. With, uh, I think we can add more nodes in one iteration uh, instead of uh, just uh, app cutoff is just one for one node. Mm. So while using address, you can add more nodes in one iteration. So it will be done faster in ID Okay. Okay. Let me ask you the following question now. Okay. Just raise your hands, okay? Because obviously you are raising so many of you are raising your hands. You know there is strength in numbers. So if you are stupid along with everybody else, it's okay, right? Raise your hands, and if you think it's a if somebody has an answer. No, raise your hands if you think more or less it will be good to use H dash. Okay. Raise your hands if you think it would be a terrible idea to use H dash. Terrible idea. Okay, why do you think it's a terrible idea? So I obviously, because there are not enough people raising their hands for the second one. Why do you think it's a terrible idea? I'm not sure, like. But well, you just basically went with the Adding a random number, you're basically like describing your restrict. That's my intuition about the restrict. Yes? So, I mean, I don't think it would be terrible, but it would be bad because if, for instance, your original heuristic has... Now, I'm going for terrible. The answer, by the way, is terrible. I'm giving you the answer. Okay. Now figure out why. <laughs> the answer is, if you use H dash, especially if you're using IDS star, it's a terrible idea. Terrible. Should never do it. Why? When was it that we said something around iterative deepening algorithms and how they can be really bad? Yes, sir. Okay. My name is Noah. So I think the closer you get it to H star, the more time it skips to the curve. No. No. When was the last time we said anything bad, really, really bad about iterative deepening search? I did the FS finally said. So basically, the worst case scenario would be the number of iterations. If an iterative deepening search does as many iterations as there are nodes, then instead of doing d iterations, it's been before d iterations, then would you agree it would be a terrible search? Does it do this? Do you see why it does this? I am adding random numbers between 0 and 1, so they are real numbers. What's the chance that two random numbers I pick would be same, extremely low? Which means everybody's H value is going to be a distinct real number. You add that to G then everybody's F value would be a distinct real number. The moment you have each F value being a distinct real number, you are dead. You see what I'm saying? This is the worst thing that, I, that can happen to IDS now. Because if the number of possible F values is as many as the number of nodes, you are dead. Yes. So, when you want to prune away the um, H uh, star values or the H prime values that are not close to H star with IDA star. No, 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 no. Notice that once I give the H dash, you just do IDA star. IDA star will use H star, H dash, and we'll have this F values and we'll make F value based cutoff. So, you start with F equal to zero. And then it increased the F2 to be the next biggest value, the, 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 the node that has was not in the previous iteration whose F value is closest to the current cutoff, and slightly bigger than that. And then it opens the door that wide. 
And if in that case, in, in this scenario, you get one node in. Every time you open the door, you get one node in. Did they spend a lot of time talking about doors being opened only one person at a time coming? You guys are all stuck with that beautiful car. <laughs> I don't have to ask a question from last class. I can ask a question from previous classes. Okay? So this is a useful thing to think about. Um, but anyway, that's sort of um, the answer for that. Okay, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, here the key point in this question was uh, that we are adding random numbers to every point, right? Yeah. So, if we are uh, adding uh, some constant value to each other, then this won't happen. Everything in my question is important. The random part is important. I mean, this, you, I mean, I was telling you that there is something, obviously, you know, this is it. This was supposed to be a question you are supposed to answer under pressure during the exam. It was not even one, it was many questions, you know, uh, one of the many questions. And some people actually got it. That's kind of nice, right? It's, um, it's easy to ask questions, harder to answer them. But, you know, it's useful to think about, you know, you know that when idea star can die, how do you make it die? Here is a way. Okay? Okay. So, um, we're going to do uh, actually game trees starting today. By the way, the attendance code is the plan, and I'm going to close it very soon. Um, and then, um, so, anyway, so this was, by the way, the, I think the, the thing that the poll that we did uh, last class, uh, right after last class, it was open for 24 hours. Looks like about 75% <laughs> of the people were fully engaged, of the people who voted. And remember, the only people who count are the ones who vote in any election. That's just the way it is. Um, and, uh, and then um, there are 13 people here. Uh, so total 13 people. So this is like 24% are lost. Um, so these guys, you're doing fine, obviously. I mean, at least. But the wavelengths are working out well. For these, I would say that if I go too much slower, then it will be, we'll not actually get enough time. Um, and, and so this is the reason we are recording everything. So take down the parts where you got lost, go back and spend time. You know, um, that's just the way to do it. And uh, these people, obviously, um, if you know, I would love to take them on as students if they actually really thought it was too slow and obvious, and so that means stuff is easy, easy for them. So please, if you have the doubts, come and talk to me, um, and uh, maybe we'll find something that you can do uh, together. Okay, but otherwise, uh, I was more worried that there'll be a lot more un um, unbalanced stuff, but this is fine. Okay. Um, so we're going to do uh, games today. So basically, we're still going to do deterministic search. Okay. Um, so think chess. Think actually uh, the in this particular case, think uh, uh, the what's that, tic tac toe, which is like the silliest uh, game that people can play. Um, and so the kind of thing that we're doing is there are two player games. We'll basically look at two player games. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stop this. Yeah, uh, they two player games, and we normally call them max and min, okay, for the reasons that we can clear to you, because the strategy for solving the game would be something called min-max strategy. And so we call them max and min, and you know, another thing is, there are many, many different kinds of games. The simplest games that we are looking at are two player and Typically, we are also considering zero-sum games. Zero-sum games means if I win, you lose. There is no such thing as both of us losing, winning, and you know having a happy life. You know, if I win, you lose. So this is actually a purely adversarial environment. So max typically, you know, basically we assume that we are finding the strategy for max player. Okay. And I'm assuming people know what tic-tac-toe is, right? Which we've been calling different different ways. Basically, it's our 
dots and crosses or whatever. So, so Max player basically uh, is deciding um, what, where should they put their cross. Right, that's the first move. Okay. In fact, by the way, here's an interesting thing. Each player only gets to make one move and then wait for the other player to make their move before they get a chance to make their move again. Right? Because uh, in fact, I you know there is if it's a, the the thing that makes games hard is the opponents. If there are no opponents, you get done much faster. Okay? Imagine playing chess when there's nobody else, you just play. Okay. Uh, are similarly this one. So in this case, you are you could put crosses in all these different places. Those are all your moves. The question is, you're asking yourself, which one should I do? And the basic idea here is, you simulate in your head. If I were to do this, let's say, if I were to do that x there, uh, that x, then basically my Opponent. So by the way, so this was the layer called max. When there's a max layer, that means it is max's turn to make a move. Okay. And by the way, in, other, in various places, we can basically try to put this for the max and this for the min. Okay. That's like max tries to drive up the value. Min tries to drive down the value of the game. And the value of the game is being seen from the max's perspective. And so if max wins, then if max gets 4, that means win got minus 4. It's a zero sum game. OK? Uh, so anyway, uh, in this case, you are essentially, if this is, after you make this move, this will be min's turn to play. Right? And when win makes its move, it basically can make various places where it can put the duck. OK? And then you have to ask yourself, you don't, you're not done yet. Okay, the question of course is, does this tell you which direction to go? Not yet. Okay, then you will go forward and say, well, at this point I will get my turn. Then I will get to make another cross. I get to put the cross anywhere I want again. Except in the places where already the cells are occupied. Right? And then Blah, 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 and then these are terminal nodes. You keep doing this at some point of time. This is a finite sized uh, board. So after enough number of extra nodes are put, in essentially you can't put any more. And in fact, after times, you might die even before that. In fact, the game might be over before that. There are certain nodes in this game that we call terminal nodes. And the terminal nodes essentially means these are sure wins to max, sure losses to max, are sure draws. Do you understand what I'm saying? To draw means neither once wins. Win means max wins. Ma no, um, loss means max wins. Okay. So in this particular case, obviously, if you remember, the, uh, if you remember how tic tac toe works, you should not be surprised that this is a loss for max. Because the other guy put three zeros and three dots in a column. So that's minus one. Okay? And then in this case, essentially nobody won because there is neither a row, diagonal, or column where it's either all zeros or all x's. So this is actually a draw board for tic tac -tac. In this case, what happened? In this case, there is a diagonal of x's, and so max 1. So what I'm basically saying is the way to solve this game normally involves you sit here and ask yourself, OK, which move should I make? But for each move I can make, essentially, I have to consider what uh, the min does, then what do I get to do, then what they get to do, then what they do, then what I do, etc., until you reach any branch a terminal node. And you expand the entire tree like this. In the entire tree, then, all the leaf nodes, that is the, the last level nodes in the entire tree, are essentially terminal nodes. They have their final value given. They have their final value given. Right? 
Now what you need to basically do is go from here, go from this information here, and figure out what should we do here. Okay? If you're thinking about what's going on here, think about the following thing. Suppose in some, you know, some um, uh, map, like say, and you know, there's an agent here in the map, it's a deterministic world, and it needs to go to go here. It could either go this way, go this way, go this way. And actually also go this way. In fact, if I go this way, it doesn't go anywhere. And it's trying to figure out which action should it do. And the way it would have solved it is it basically calls A star search or some search strategy which will tell it, well, the shortest path is this. And then basically this the first action of that is going up, so it does the first action, which is going up. Did you understand what I just said? That's what single agent is supposedly doing. It's figuring out the entire way all the way to the goal, um, um, the optimal path to the goal, so that it can then do the first action. In fact, since there is, in, if, you are, if you don't have an opponent, and if the world isn't changing, then you can also do the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and all the way until the end. In games, unfortunately, you don't get to do that. You only just make your first action and wait for what the other guy does. So we're doing the same kind of idea, except here there is you and the min. You're considering both the agents' possibilities. OK? Now, the question, of course, is just as here in the single agent, the direction you're supposed to go finally came about after you had the full path. The optimal direction to go came about after you had the full path. And whatever is the full path's first action was, that's the first action you're supposed to do. Right? So that's what we're going to do here too, essentially. The question, of course, is what do I do with these numbers here and go up? Okay? That's the crux of the problem. Uh, let me just cross over this right now. And uh, so this is... Here. No, no, this is the way we're going to do it right now. And then we try to improve it, OK? Um, so, so basically, I have a tree like this, right? And I have I have somehow took all the time. Right now, I don't care about the time I take. So I took all the time, and I made the entire tree. And then I know the values for all the leaf nodes, OK? At that point, I just need to figure out, given these leaf node values, what should have been my choice here? That's the crux of the problem you're trying to solve in game search. There are also other issues such as why should you even do the entire tree? In fact, for any game other than tic-tac-toe, entire tree will be dead. So then we'll talk about other things such as not having to do the entire tree. But first figure out what you're supposed to do when you have the entire tree in front of you and everything in the bottom is leaf nodes. What are you supposed to do? Once you figure that out, and once you figure out how to do that more efficiently, which is what's called alpha beta print. So the first idea, what to do when you have all the lower level nodes and what should be your strategy at the top, that idea is basically the celebrated min-max search. OK? Um, in fact, the guy who came up with min-max search is somebody who you heard of, uh, because you always call a computer architecture X computer architecture. The standard computer architecture is called what? Von Neumann architecture. Von Neumann never touched a computer. He, you know, basically, he's not a real engineer, it's, but he's a polymath, he's a mathematician. And he actually came up with min max search. How many of you have seen A Beautiful Mind, the movie? There is a little scene with Von Neumann. Because John Nash essentially was felt, always felt that he could not compete with, you know, one I'm on. Okay, anyway, so one I'm on came up with, uh, he and Morgan Stern came up with this idea of min-max search and proved its properties. It's not such a hard idea, actually. Proving properties is more interesting. So, anyway, um, now one of the two things, before I go forward, actually, I'll come back to this in a minute, but, so, 
I want you to understand that here I showed you a real game with each node being an actual game position. Now I'll abstract this out and I'll say this is the way I'll think about the game tree now. It's a different game. Okay? Where this was the max nodes, these are the mean nodes, and so basically max basically can do either A1 or A2 or A3. And then min gets to do either A11, A12 or A13. Similarly, A21, A22, A23, etc. At which point, suddenly, everything becomes leaf <coughs> node. I made myself a nice example now. And in this leaf node, I'll also allow for, it doesn't have to be minus one, plus one. I'll just give it any numbers. Okay, these leaf values, this is three good, this is 12 good, this is eight good, two good, four good, six good, 14 good, five good, two good. Okay, now all this goodness is with respect to max. It's 14 good basically means it's this place. If you can somehow get yourself to do the action on the top such that you will eventually come here, right? That will be 14 good for you. That means the other guy will lose 14. Okay? So, at this point, I have the tree, right? I have in front of me everything that I need. So the question is, what do you think A1 should do? Uh, what, what do you think Nat should do? Should we take A1 or A2 or A3? <coughs> yeah, but what is maximum of A1, A2, A3? Uh, we get from the 3 to uh, So basically what you're doing is do the right thing. Which is basically what you're saying. Do the action that will give you the best value. Now, but what will give you the best value? You have to come from bottom up. You have to do what's called backward induction. It's a pretty obvious idea. So somehow I have to go from these three, twelve, and A and ask myself what should this guy's value be. So if this is three, this is twelve, this is eight, what is this guy's value? What? Why three? Did you know your opponent? Did you know that the opponent will act deterministically and always take three? So it's important to know what you're doing here. What you're doing is you have decided that your opponent would be fully bloodthirsty, would be fully out to get you, and has as big a brain as you do, maybe bigger brain. Okay? It's a fully rational agent who is out to get you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? In that case, it's a conservative strategy to assume that the opponent would maximize their value just as you are maximizing your value. Okay? Maximizing their value is basically minimizing your number. So you will wind up taking min of these three, and I'll get a three here. And similarly, I'll wind up taking a min of these three, I'll get a two here. I'll take min of these three, I'll get a two here. Right? At this point, now, this will be taken up again. And at this point, this guy will have to pick whatever is the value that's highest. Clearly, they'll pick, max will pick three. Okay? So, then, the value here is three. Okay? And, this is called the value of the game at this point from Max's perspective. And this is the maximum value of the game, essentially. Okay? And it comes because it takes this step. Right? It just take this step and you get the three, that's done. So this is the computation that Max will do, and then we'll say, okay, I'll do A1. Okay? At that point, the game has, went, has gone one extra step. Now, Min, if in fact Min is also playing rationally and is a computer, they would too use a min-max search strategy, except they would be essentially looking for the min of these values. You see what I'm saying? If on the other hand, if you are 
So here's the question. Then is this way of playing playing um, uh, alpha beta, I'm sorry, this way of play, playing this game a dumb idea? Yes? If the opponent isn't playing optimally, so if they, there's not an optimal strategy that they always follow, then you want to go 83 to potentially maximize your... So here's the deal. Suppose you're playing with, I think I mentioned this at some point of time, maybe already. Suppose you're playing with Gary Kasparov. You should do this. If you, this is a chess game and you're playing with Gary Kasparov, you should do this. If on the other hand, you're playing with your two-year-old nephew, who can't tell the difference between a piece of candy and the chessboard, and you're taking about three hours for each move, everybody will say, what a loser. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? By assuming that this two-year-old kid is perfectly rational and is out to get you like a piranha, you are wasting your valuable resources that you could have used to do homework for this problem, you know, for us or something. Because there's only so much time in your life, and you have to decide what's the optimal amount of time to spend on each of these things. You see what I'm saying? So this only makes sense if you assume that the opponent is truly out to get you or you are optimizing only one metric, which is not losing. Nothing else matters. You just want to maximize the probability of not losing. Then min-max is your way to go. OK? If, there, if you play min-max on the full tree, if you play min-max on the full tree, OK? then you will not ever lose the game if there is a way of winning the game. That's your completeness so, you know, property. Just like you know, if you do a star search with a visible heuristic, if there is an optimal path, you will find the optimal path. Similarly, if you do min-max on a full tree, you will never lose the game if, in fact, you can win the game, if there is a way of winning the game. OK? Now, going back to this previous slide, you would say that a game is considered solved. A game is considered solved if it can be shown that the match player has a winning or a non-losing strategy. OK? That's when the game is solved. It's different from being the world champion. I hope you understand this. Solving means even if people from Mars who are supposedly much smarter than us come and play you, you will still not lose to them. Yeah. No, no, I'm just looking from the Max's perspective. For this play, for this game, I'm looking from the Max's perspective. Okay? So Understand the following thing, that if a game is solved, that means computationally there is really no point in playing that game. How many of you play tic-tac-toe? You're all losers. <laughs> Why? Because tic-tac-toe is solved. 